and thank you for joining me for A Thousand Years of Climate Change at Dublin Castle for Earth Day 2021. The local climate has been hugely important to the long history of Dublin Castle. It refers to our average weather conditions like temperature, rain, wind and other factors over an extended period of time. Our climate allowed humans to inhabit Dublin in the first place and built castles and built cities along the coast of Ireland. There is no question about the existence of climate change. Climates have been forever changing. Changes in climate can result from changes in the sun's intensity, volcanic eruptions, and as we know now, from human activity as well. The only question is exactly how disastrous our impact will be upon this rapidly changing climate and how will we react to those changes in future. For those questions, we can look to lessons from our history and how changes in climate have affected and even collapsed societies of the past. When we look in and underneath Dublin Castle, we find structures from the Viking era. We find medieval towers that are over 800 years old and furnished rooms from the last three centuries. The castle's history stretches back to what's known as the medieval warm period around the 9th to the 14th century CE the Little Ice Age around the 14th to the 19th century CE, and the Industrial Revolution and the present day climate emergency. This will be a brief overview of these eras. So for more information, you can see the resources linked. We know about various challenges of the past, such as crop failures and famines from written evidence, but it can be difficult to determine the exact environmental conditions without modern day weather instruments recording data. This can be answered by the trees that lived through these time periods. So we're starting off inside the Chapel Royal of Dublin Castle as a really visually striking example of a wooden structure. I know it doesn't look wooden. You can see the carved wood of the galleries, but also what appears to be stone in this image is actually timber covered in painted plaster as a visual illusion. Using wood affected the overall weight of the chapel in the lower courtyard, uh, which actually has a river running underneath it. So we'll delve into that a bit later, but I want to talk about these samples of wood, which are really important as a natural archive to document environmental conditions of the past, because dendrochronology uses the rings seen inside trees to see how the tree's growth was affected each year. This information can be hugely valuable, particularly with trees that are hundreds or even a thousand years old. Another way of gathering information about climates of the past is using ice core data, which can provide us with data from hundreds of thousands of years ago. Another source of information is accounts written by people. This gets really interesting because not only do we have written records such as the Irish Annals taking note of extreme weather events, but humans also often try to determine why these events occurred in the first place. So we're moving into the throne room of Dublin Castle, which displays six mythological scenes painted by Gaetano Gandolfi in the 1700s. But the scenes they depict, the stories they tell, are much older than the paintings themselves. Here's a closer look now at one of these scenes. This is one from Homer's Odyssey, in which Odysseus receives a bag of winds, which will help him on his journey home. And floating in the air, you see Aeolus, warden of the gales. And this kind of story is not at all unusual for natural occurrences and weather conditions to be credited or blamed upon deity. It was a really common thread and still is across many different religions and beliefs. Roman pagans would make sacrifices at festivals to ask the gods for good conditions for crops. Beliefs in pre-Christian Ireland are seen as a nature-based pagan religion with festivals and practices revolving around harvests and the changing seasons. Many of these practices would continue with the introduction of Christianity. And throughout Dublin Castle, we see references to St. Patrick bringing Christianity to Ireland in the fifth century CE. Belief in a higher power that could affect weather continued with Christianity. As with gods, a saint's power was often credited in how they could miraculously affect non-human nature. With the introduction of Christianity, pagan festivals for crops it became Christian festivals known as, for instance, the Major Rogation and Roman Catholic Rogation Days, which involved praying for crops. These would ask to be blessed with good weather and adequate rain, because as anyone knows who's ever watered a plant before, how much you water or don't water it enough is hugely going to affect how the plant grows. And seeing as people rely on plants for food, too much or too little rain can be devastating. 
We're now going down underneath Dublin Castle, down into the Viking excavation. Here we see a Viking era stone embankment alongside the River Poddle. Between the 8th and the 12th century, Vikings used what's known as the medieval warm period to travel, to raid and to trade. In order to travel and settle in places like Greenland and Iceland, a relatively warm climate with warmer air, warmer sea temperatures and less ice was hugely desirable to the Vikings. They favoured places along the coast, which had usable agricultural land. They could travel to places that had longer growing seasons and therefore have more food. As always, climate, environmental conditions and crops were hugely important during the Viking era. So our site in Dublin, at the junction of the River Liffey, the poddle running underneath the castle, and being on the east coast of Ireland, this was a great location. Vikings turned Dublin into a thriving centre of trade. Not only did the city develop here because of its natural features, but the city is actually named after one of those natural features, Dove Lynn, translated as Black Pool. This Black Pool was once located where the Dublin Castle Gardens are today alongside the River Poddle. We really can't talk about Irish history without talking about water because we're literally surrounded by water in Ireland. And we can't talk about climate change without talking about water because climate change affects water in so many ways. It affects sea levels, precipitation, drought, floods, and water is absolutely essential for life on Earth. Water is the reason why Dublin Castle is located on this spot, near to the sea, next to the Liffey, on top of the Poddle. Water has been the site of battles in the past, and it's been the motivation for some of Dublin's biggest protests in recent years. Today, the world faces water scarcity like never before because of drought, but also because of pollution. We have more people in the world than ever before today, and we have the same amount of drinking water, arguably less because of pollution. Water is not only used for drinking, but also for growing food. It's used for hygiene, for transport, it's used for trade, and it's been used for defence. And the Vikings knew this all too well, as did their opposition in the Battle of Clontarf, Brian Baru. Here we have Brian Baru, one of more than 100 stone heads carved on the exterior of Dublin Castle, depicting important people in Irish life and history. So this High King of Ireland is said to have been, sorry, said to have been born near Killaloo in the 10th century CE. And we have no one alive today that witnessed the events of his life, of course, but some do suspect that we have trees still standing from this time. There's an oak tree known as Brian Brew's Oak in County Clare, near to where he was born, which some estimate to be a thousand years old. It's 32 feet in circumference. Ancient trees are an invaluable natural archive, particularly during the Middle Ages as we transition from the medieval warm period to a time known as the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age is a climate interval of lower average temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere that's said to stretch over as many as six different centuries, from the 14th all the way to the 19th century CE. At this time, glaciers expanded in the European Alps, communities experienced food shortages and displacement. You can take a look at the resources linked here if you'd like to learn more detail about the Little Ice Age and how low solar activity and volcanic events contributed to it. But we're going to take a look at some periods of crisis around this time. And this includes the Black Death, when the bubonic plague devastated Europe in the 14th century. The plague hit Ireland in 1348. It's said that there were 100 people dying per day in Dublin and almost a third of Europe's population would be killed. UN reports of zoonotic disease today tell us that climate change is a major factor in disease emergence. Changes in temperature can affect the spread of infectious disease in a number of ways. Changes in temperature affect rodent numbers and fleas infecting humans. It affects migration of animals, including human migration, which can affect population density and temperature also affects food supply and overall health. Though the Black, Black Death is seen as one of the greatest crises faced in the Middle Ages, Ireland had many more turbulent years to follow. The Irish annals give us a hint into this time period. They often have a focus on weather and how that affects crops, animals and humans. The annals of Loch Kay mention very severe weather, wet weather destroying corn crops, excessive bad weather, frost, snow, mortality of cattle, destruction of food, scarcity of food and clothing, famine, great rain, great havoc on birds, cattle and people. So stability of weather 
played and still plays a huge role in both rural life and Dublin city. During the Little Ice Age, Dublin Castle was the seat of English and later British rule in Ireland. It served as a residence for the British monarch's Irish representative. Under successive British monarchs, the exploitation and destruction in some cases of Irish land and trees intensified. The plantations of Ireland brought settlers who cleared forest to use the timber and use the land as well for agriculture. Other factors contributing to tree decline included things like shipbuilding, iron production, and this also coincided with the invention of the furnace. Some native populations were left to rely upon ecologically less favorable land. Cold weather and disease is said to have added to their disadvantages and aided Lord deputies like Mount Joy and his scorched earth policy. The changes in land ownership brought changes in land management practices. This altered the Irish environment significantly. Many Irish forests of the 16th century would disappear. Ireland saw the loss of native plant life and animal life. Some trees survived to this period and still stand today. A tree known as the Silken Thomas Yew is found in Maynooth today and said to be up to 100, oh, sorry, 800 years old. This was a time of major political upheaval and Silken Thomas was a rebel leader. Legend tells us that he sat under the yew tree playing the lute the night before surrendering to the king. An artist featured in Dublin Castle's collection who lived through some of the harshest decades of the Little Ice Age is Anthony Van Dyke. He was known for his portraits, such as this one of Elizabeth Lee, which is in the drawing room of Dublin Castle. But some of his contemporaries focused on landscape painting and they saw a really different landscape to what we have today. Hendrik Avercamp painted rivers frozen over in mainland Europe. Frozen rivers were also seen in Ireland and Britain where there were even frost fairs held on the frozen Thames. Some of these images focus on lighthearted merriment and cold weather and occasions, but other consequences would be devastating. Some of the darkest times of the Little Ice Age saw crop failures, food shortages and starvation. People looked for someone to blame and in Europe we actually saw a spike in witch hunts. While some credited God for blessing them with food, some blamed witchcraft for cursing them with shortages. In the 16th century, accusations of magic affecting weather happened with a really striking frequency. Cold winters, snow, frost, rain, floods, these could all be blamed on supposedly sinful members of society. While the Virgin Mary was seen as a symbol of fertility, women accused of witchcraft were accused of causing infertile land. Not only were many women accused, but they were also tortured into agreeing with a confession and executed. That said, King James VI of Scotland was said to have believed in witchcraft only after uh, some incidents with severe storms. And in 1597, he published a book on witchcraft called Demonology, which delves further into weather related magic and also tells us how to try a witch. Here we read, and I'm gonna quote from his book. There are two other good helps that may be used for their trial. The one is the finding of their mark the other is their fleeting on the water, that the water shall refuse to receive them in her bosom, shaken off then the sacred water of baptism. So what they're saying here quite horribly is that the accused could either sink or be found guilty of witchcraft. Although Ireland didn't in any way see the same witch hunts as mainland Europe, Ireland wasn't completely immune to this phenomenon, with accusations upon women such as Alice Kither, Petronella de Medea, and the island McGee witches as well. Many witch hunts coincided with a time period known as the Grindelwald fluctuation in Europe, a 16th to 17th century cooling phase during the Little Ice Age. Temperature drops can reduce harvest yields, decrease the number of days that crops can ripen and therefore lower uh, food production. Harvests are crucial to understand how the Little Ice Age and temperature change can affect people. Less food means that food becomes more expensive which means there's less expenditure for other things, which means there's fewer jobs, which means there's more poverty, which means there's more starvation, more poor health, more disease and more death. Cold weather continued and the 18th century brought a crisis in Ireland, which is known as the forgotten famine. Though the image here is actually meant to depict a later famine. 
Climatic shocks hit Europe in the winter of 1739. People noted violently stormy weather and freezing temperatures. The Dublin press initially wrote about the novelty of people dancing and playing games on the ice. But soon the death rate trebled, coal prices rose, people needed fuel, and so some were arrested for felling trees in Phoenix Park. Without fuel, the city became literally darker at night. Food production was not only affected directly by the weather, but also by the frozen water affecting the water powered mills. Within a few weeks, charity collections had to begin. The Lord Lieutenant of Dublin Castle, the Duke of Devonshire, authorised prohibiting export of grain to anywhere other than Britain. As February came in, Dean Swift said, we have almost done with this cursed weather. That's around the same time the Liffey started to thaw. However, soon came drought, and so grain prices doubled. There wasn't enough food to feed the human population, let alone to feed farm animals, so many of those animals were left to die. The number of children buried in Dublin rose greatly. Not only were the crops badly affected in 1740 at this time, but without enough seed potatoes for the following year, they knew that food shortages were going to continue. By May, bread riots began in Dublin. The army was sent to patrol the old streets. Grain prices remained high throughout the summer, and by the end of the year, Dublin wheat prices reached an all-time high. It would be lower income households and rural communities who would suffer the most, and of course, many resorted to stealing. Many were arrested, imprisoned, and transported for stealing food during times of famine. Here we see a close up of a table in Dublin Castle made by an inmate of the Dublin debtors prison. Weather extremes can be devastating on both sides, whether it's freezing winters or summer droughts. A Belfast newsletter of summer 1806 included the poem about drought, which shares an insight into the socio-economic effects of drought in Ireland. The poem read, See the demon drought appears, Wide he waves his fiery wing, Drinking up night's dewy cheers, Praying on the bloom of spring. Agriculture droops his head, As the withering power he eyes, Flora's heart is filled with dread, While with thirst her offspring dies. At this time, plans were in place for the opening of the Chapel Royal in Dublin Castle, but just four months after the chapel opened, Mount Tambora erupted. And this was a major volcanic eruption which affected people around the world. It was followed by decreased global temperatures, crop failures, epidemics, thousands of deaths from starvation and disease, and what's known as the year without a summer in 1816. In Ireland, this was said to be eight weeks of successive rain, destroying hay and corn crops. The price of bread rose and the usual consequences occurred, although the effects of the year without a summer, they were felt worldwide, but not everyone realised that. And so there was an increase in Irish people applying for permission to leave the country. In September 1816, Daniel O'Connell wrote, between the fall of prices and the dreadful weather, there is nothing but rain and wretchedness. When there are not enough crops to feed the human population, there's not enough to breed and feed domesticated animals. Interestingly, the year without a summer coincided with the introduction of an alternative for using horses for transport, something known as the dandy horse, or as we know it today, the bicycle. Although there would be growing popularity for the bicycle over the next hundred years, it would fail to catch up with the steam engine and the speed of the industrial revolution. Although the major long terms of the sorry the major long term effects of the industrial revolution were yet to be realised, changes were quickly seen in nineteenth century Dublin. Railroads would connect Dublin to the rest of Ireland. A once handcrafted agrarian society was transformed by industrialised machinery. The arrival of the steam engine and greater use of fossil fuels began shaping the political and economic landscape that we know today. And the world from this point saw a completely different use of energy using fossil fuels. At the same time, new weather instruments recorded data which would later become absolutely vital for assessing post-industrial climate change. In 1861, an Irish physicist named John Tyndall showed that certain gases could cause a warming greenhouse effect, though the full extent of this had yet to be realised. In spite of this effect, the birth of the Industrial Revolution brought many advantages, such as the possibility of greater food production. But it was quickly followed by one of the darkest periods in Irish history, 
Here we have a painting of Queen Victoria in Dublin Castle from the 1840s, which is on display in the drawing room today. The 1840s in Ireland saw the devastating Great Potato Famine. The famine affected Ireland with the death and emigration of millions of people, but also with the long lasting effects upon Irish language and culture. Now it's important to recognize that food scarcities tend not to affect everyone equally. Starvation seen around the world isn't always because of a lack of food, but can be because of a lack of access to food. When food scarcities arise, prices go up. So food can be hoarded by the wealthy while the poor are left to starve. Visitors to Dublin Castle in the 1840s faced little evidence of the ongoing disaster. For instance, Queen Victoria visited in 1849 and for her arrival, improvements were being made to the drawing room, to the ballroom and to the ceiling in the throne room, which was actually raised for her arrival. Lavish, lavish celebrations continued for the aristocracy, even while so many people starved to death. Queen Victoria would become known by some as the famine queen and criticized for not doing enough. There is rarely one cause of a major disaster. Often it's related to weather, but also the decisions made around that. A major factor which influences our lives and our environment and was a huge issue during and after the Great Potato Famine is land ownership. Land is more often owned by privileged groups in the case of 19th century Ireland, often by wealthy English men. Many will argue that men in power misused their ownership of land to shape an unsustainable environment. There have been women arrested and held at Dublin Castle who had campaigned for tenants' rights, for workers' rights, for women's rights. When women celebrated the right to vote in 1918, it was initially only land-owning women who were allowed to vote. And of course, women were the minority when it came to land ownership. Irish eco-feminist activist Eva Gore Booth compared men to the destruction of nature and she compared women to the natural world in her poem, which is called Women's Rights. In the poem, she says, men have got their towers and walls, we have cliffs and waterfalls. Men have got their pomp and pride, all the green world is on our side. These major human rights issues contributed to the desire for an independent Irish Republic in the hopes of achieving equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens. This room in Dublin Castle is known as the James Connolly Room and is a really important landmark in the story of the Easter Rising of 1916. At the time, the State Apartments of the castle became a Red Cross infirmary for soldiers wounded in the First World War. James Connolly was one of many people who led the rebellion against British rule in Ireland known as the Easter Rising. James Connolly was brought here to be treated for his wounds before being taken to Kilmainham jail to be executed. His body wasn't returned to his family for burial, but he was buried alongside the other leaders at Arbor Hill Cemetery, which is overlooked by a sycamore tree which still stands beside the grave today. This was a major turning point in the struggle for independence. It was followed by the Irish War of Independence and in 1922, Dublin Castle was handed over to the Irish Free State. A new nation raised its flag over the building and a new government took on the challenges that lay ahead. By the 1920s, burning fossil fuels emitted 1 billion tonnes of carbon per year for the first time in human history. We know from past ice ages and warm periods that the Earth's climate has changed before, but in the 20th century, we faced a very different issue. Modern energy use, destruction of nature, greenhouse gas emissions was like nothing we'd ever seen before. By the 1950s, it was acknowledged that humans were carrying out a large scale geophysical experiment on our own planet. By the 1970s, the phenomenon became known as global warming. Human activity now contributes significantly to disastrously rapid climate change, resulting in increased temperatures, rising sea levels, drought, flooding, extreme weather, and this is all changing at a rate we have never experienced. The human activities include burning fossil fuels emitting carbon dioxide, agricultural practices emitting methane and nitrous oxide, and changing land use. In 1988, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, was formed and it was recognised that there was no more time to ignore the rising catastrophe. In 1990, Mary Robinson ran for president in Ireland with campaign literature, which is shown here, calling for a president fighting for our environment and our heritage, our, our heritage but committed to our future. 
She was elected and her inauguration took place in St. Patrick's Hall of Dublin Castle. Her achievements would stretch far and wide, not only as President of Ireland, but also as a UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. In 1997, after her presidency, she focused on international human rights concerns during what was the warmest year on record, an idea which shockingly we've now become accustomed to hearing. Mary Robinson quickly made the connection between climate change and human rights concerns and began campaigning for climate justice. In 2019, Dublin Castle hosted the National Biodiversity Conference to address increasing temperatures and the loss of local and global biodiversity, plants and animals being lost at a rate unprecedented in human history. This acknowledged that the natural systems that give us food to eat, give us air to breathe and water to drink are now disappearing. Three months later, Ireland became the second country in the world to declare a climate and biodiversity emergency. And then came 2020, a year that drastically changed day-to-day -day life in Dublin Castle and around the world. As a government building with venues and conference centres, Dublin Castle became a centre for information and announcements regarding the COVID-19 crisis. The UN Environment Programme released its report in 2020 on preventing the next pandemic, listing climate change as one of the seven human mediated factors most likely driving the emergence of zoonotic disease. It states that the drivers of pandemics are often also the drivers of climate change and biodiversity loss. Epidemic zoonoses are often triggered by events such as climate variability, flooding and other extreme weather and famines. Today, the IPCC tells us that we have very little time to limit global warming and that we need major transitions, which would be unprecedented in terms of scale, but not necessarily in terms of speed. We face challenges today that have never been encountered before, but we have advantages today that we've never had before. We have the means to both learn from our past, but also the means to anticipate the future. Some say that history is most important while it's happening. And our actions today will affect the future of life on Earth. So thank you very much for listening to this very short summary of a thousand years of climate change at Dublin Castle for Earth Day 2021. If you found it interesting, please feel free to take a look at our other resources.